Today, we're taking you back to one of the most iconic decades in automotive history. An era that brought us big hair, new wave, and the explosion of video games also brought us some of the most iconic automobiles in history, from the DeLorean to the Firebird. Welcome to the 2018 Forza Racing Championship live from Seattle. My name is Bravo and we're continuing to race our way through the decades and today we're headed back to the 80s. Series 1 champion Noble Box is looking to go two for two in Series 2, but Lage is back in action after missing out on round number one races and looking to make a statement. We've got some rad car and track combos today for you from the decade of greed and today we'll find out who has the eye of the tiger and who will just beat it. Welcome to the Forza Racing Championship Wednesday Showdown. Hey folks, welcome to the EMEA Wednesday Showdown. My name is Bravo. I'm joined by Brian Eckberg. Brian, it's good hey, to be back. It's great to be sitting side by side. I know, right? Usually we're, we're apart from each yeah, other. But normally we're side by side. It's nice, it's nice. Well, really? Not only that, but of course we've got the GNX with us oh, in yeah. studio. We're going to be talking a lot about this car. This thing is, is, is beautiful and, a, and a, a wild badass beast. But let's talk about the significance of racing in the 80s. For this series, we're racing through the decades. Last week you saw 60s and 70s, but today it's all about the 80s. It's all about the 80s turbocharged cars. You know, we have the GNX here, which is all about straight line speed. Uh, the, the viewers are going to have some options for voting that we'll get into in a minute. But we also have, you know, a, a classic late 80s Audi Quattro IMSA racer right. and the C9. Uh, the Mercedes-Benz Group C Monster, a leaderboard car in Forza 7. These guys are going to know this car backwards right. and forwards. And kind of some wild days of motorsport, right? I mean, we ha here we have the, the like you said, the, the 90 Quattro before a bunch of regulations came down on that vehicle. Right. So that thing's going to be a, uh, able to get around the track uh, in the dry or the wet, uh, which will be exciting to see. It was a great time, right? Yeah. Safety wasn't such a big deal. It was all about speed. Yep. Get to the finish line first. That was the 80s. These cars are going to be a lot of fun today. Right. And speaking of, of course, we're going to have the GNX in a poll. We want to make sure that uh, we talk about that. But speaking of the poll and you guys watching at home, make sure you get involved. Head to watch.forza.rc.com to complete quests and unlock prizes. You see a bunch of fantastic looking cars here. You got the DB9, the Civic as well, and some liveries as well that we're going to have for this show. Uh, by the way, got to give a huge shout out to the Forza RC production team for this sweet 80s theme here. Oh, man. I'm loving the synth wave. I'm in it right now. It's, it's taking me right back I'm to my in. childhood. I love this. And that livery, look on at the livery C9. on the C9. That yeah. is incredible. You're going to see that car later today. You might see the Stradale, depending on how you vote at home. Great looking car as well. We also have a driver suit here, that midnight driver suit with the bandana. All 80s all day here. Yeah, that's right. That's how we roll. Absolutely. Of course, speaking of though, we do have that race two pole, which is going to be ready. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. And it's a big question. Is the GNX versus the Stradale? Now, Brian, you and I talked about this. We'd like the community to self-organize here and yes. make sure that they vote for the GNX in one race right. and the Stradale in another. That way we can, everyone's happy. We're going to see both cars today. We'll let you guys take care of that. And you couldn't have two more different cars here. We're going to be on Homestead, which is a car that has a lot of speed to it and some tricky corners. Both of these cars are going to handle this track in a very different way. Absolutely. So excited to see exactly how that nets out between the poles. Remember, watch that ForzaRC.com to uh, vote on which car you want to see in race number two. But of course, also, racers have to, the drivers have to race quite a bit to get to this point here. That's right. And the last point in that, uh, <clears throat> last point on that tour, of course, is the Sunday races. Let's go ahead and take a look at the highlights. The races began with a bang in EMEA with JSR Rossi starting off pole position following his dominance in week one. A nail-biting start for the European drivers, bottlenecking into turn one gave Williams Mitch all the room he needed to make matters worse for Bam Seven. Seven couldn't deal with the relentless pressure from Mitch, but it was Rossi who was on flying form as he nailed the win in race one. A cloudy day at Homestead saw the Europeans in unfamiliar culture. It was anyone's race with side-by-side -side action, drivers grabbing points left, right and centre. 
Meanwhile, Mitch capitalised on Rossi's unforced breaking error to steal the win in the Buick, relegating Rossi to second place. Race 3 saw the return of Road Atlanta, a track where scenic beauty and deadly corners go hand in hand. It was a superb cutback on the first lap which saw Rossi lead the Merc train through the S's. Disaster at the back though for the FCT boys desperate to accumulate points found a one-way ticket to the pit lane. Upon exiting the pit lane, Joker in frustration displayed horrendous retaliation on lapping traffic sending Matt Gaming into the wall and received a 20 second penalty for his actions. It was good times over the Jack Speed Racing, with Rossi winning two out of three races. In a Lobby B box had it all to do, a good start was essential, knowing Lage was just behind him. It soon became a battle for second with Roadrunner and Lage locking horns as the Frenchman tried to find a way through up ahead. Fox released the shackles on the car number four and took it straight to victory. Roadrunner on the grass and Chemical left in smoke trackside paved the way for Lage to finally pile the pressure on the Series 1 champion. Unfortunately for Lage, his questionable overtaking was met with a position penalty, gifting Box the win and found himself back in second. For the final EMEA race, there was nothing Box could have done to prevent the sheer pace of Lage and Roadrunner slipping through to take the top two spots on the podium. Box will have to settle for second on the grid behind Rossi going into today's racing. All right, of course, lots to talk about there, Brian, this series, uh, and, and even coming out of Sunday heats as well. Box is still out front. Box is still defending that Series 1 playoff championship. Yeah. You know, it would have been easy for him to say, I've done it, I've won, I'm mm -hmm. going to take it easy in Series 2. But he's thinking the long game. He's yeah. thinking about those finals. He wants to be in a great position for the finals. He's working hard. I yeah, love I it. I think a lot of people, myself included, are wondering how long can Box hold on to this? We saw him dominate at the Series 1 playoffs, and mm -hmm. now coming into Week 1 last week, so strong, and now still sitting on pole. He looks comfortable there, but another person who's comfortable on pole is Lage, but yep. he's not there. He misses out week one races. We got to talk about that, of course. Unable to compete in week one, he loses, he loses points there, so yeah. everything's going to count for this guy. Yeah, and we we always talk about Lage as a guy who loves to be up front. He he loves once he's in pole position, he's forget gonna it. he's gonna exactly forget it. He's gonna take off. He's starting third today because, as you said, he missed last week. Yeah. So again, another guy who doesn't have to worry about being in the finals, but he wants to set himself up for the best possible position to start the race because we know where he's comfortable. Right. And he wasn't there in Series 1 playoffs, right? He wasn't in pole, and we saw a, a lackluster performance from Lage. Lage is the guy you expect to be in that competition. Yeah, and let's not forget, he is, uh, wh where is he on the global I think 26th global. 26th global. Yeah. So we don't necessarily think of Lage that far down. No way. And missing a week certainly hurts that, but right. I, I think he'll be fine today. I think if he gets uh, starts third in the race number one, if he makes up a few positions, I think he'll be right. just fine. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see all series long, Box versus Lage, who's going to get, can Lage get into the top spot or will Box defend it? We're about to find out, folks. We're getting ready for race number one. Let's toss it over the desk to Scott Cole and Ali Tack. Appreciate it, gentlemen. Good start to the show thus far. And, of course, everyone's wanting to know where we're going to go, what we're going to be racing in. And, of course, the stakes we know are already high. Once again, we're back again with my partner, Ali Tack. And, Ali... We spend so much time talking about Lage, should we spend more time talking about Box? It looks like it. So, so strong. This season, isn't it great to see Box up there still dominating after the playoffs? Uh, as Brian said, still putting the work in. Good for him. By the way, uh, when you look at the rosters here, you can see number two in the global leaderboard is Box. Rossi uh, jumping up to second here. There's Lage. But what about the Williams brothers with Mitch actually besting Roadrunner right now. This is really interesting. It's the battle for dominance at the Williams eSport team. Mitch managing to sneak ahead of, Ro of Roadrunner. And this is all happening on a day where Roadrunner should be winning. Most of the cars out there are race cars. He's comfortable in those. So Mitch beating Roadrunner on home turf. Let's take a look at the other half of the pack here in round two of Series 2. Virus, anything can happen. Veloce Virus <laughs> is out on the circuit, so watch out for him. But a good showing here by Mr. Jack and also Kaiser Wolf getting himself in into this 12 that we'll see out on the circuit. It's great to see Kaiser Wolf out racing in the EMA finals. Uh, this isn't a week that's necessarily going to really suit him. The cars out there are a little bit understeery, a few of them, and that's not a weakness that he's usually able to... Uh, to work his way 
around. By the way, I'm loving our 80s colors here. <laughs> uh, apparently, our guys over there didn't get the memo, but let's take a look <laughs> at the car and the track here for race number one. We're going to be uh, in this 1989 Audi 90 Quattro IMSA version, and it is... 711 brake horsepower, and it's got so much acceleration. Love it for VIR. Absolutely incredible. Four-wheel drive, 0 to 60 in 2.5 seconds, which is incredible. Uh, the track here, a very thin ribbon of asphalt across the uh, Virginia countryside. Difficult one to keep all four wheels on the track. My second favorite circuit in the game, just behind Spa, is VIR. And it is going to be incredible to see this Audi out on the track. And here is the starting grid order for race number one. We talked about Box being up on top. Rossi in second. Will he finally climb to the top of the mountain? And then Lage in third. Can he prove he's more than just a lead dog? Here we go. Lights are out on VIR, and it's time to rock and roll as we head down through turn number one. A little bit of a lock up there from Box, but he's able to straighten it out on through up to the NASCAR bin. It's going to be lap one of eight here off the start. You can see Lage has already poked his way up into that second position. Mitch in third, so I'm not sure what happened with Rossi there off the start. We'll have to take a look at it a little later on in the race, what has him dropping back. So it's Box, Lage, and Williams, Mitch, uh, rounding out your top three. Neat and tidy for all the drivers here as they push their way through the first sector. We're now first time into this fast snake of turns, seven through 10. This left-hander box on possibly one of the hardest corners in the game, let alone around this track. And the car's just about keeping their wheels in the grass. Love the dust being thrown into the air right there. Well, Rossi had started in P2, but he's all the way at the back of the pack as they get on the back straight here at VIR. Up and over the crest. There's something had to happen there in the early going for Rossi to drop all the way back. He's pushed himself to 11 now. And just. I mean, L Lage was able at turn one to throw a move on box, so it makes me wonder whether L Rossi stalled the car on the line, something like that, because Lage wasn't having to navigate his way around Rossi into that first corner. Uh, through the roller coaster, coming up on turn 17. And he'll straighten back out and go across the start finish line. Box still in that default livery out front. Lage is hot on his heels as they head back down to turn number one for the second time. Scott Cole and Ali Tack with you here. Race one of three today here in uh, EMEA. And then we have the North American crew coming up a little later on tonight. Of course, we're here live in Seattle as we are every other week as the road to Mexico City is starting to get more and more interesting. Somebody who's doing a great job here. Just looking on the ticker is seventh place, XRS Kaiser Wolf, starting in 12th. He's now moving his way well up this pack. So a, a good run there from Kaiser Wolf. We're on board with second place. Lage, though, as we head into that snake. Once again, left, right, left, right, left. Yeah, you know, see Kaiser Wolf currently in seventh, trailing virus. So he's made some moves early, been very aggressive here in our first two laps as they head down to where the old oak tree used to be years ago out at VIR. We are in full, and you can see Roadrunner off on the side a little bit, but able to recover, straighten up, no loss of position. Straight away, Roadrunner looks under pressure here, race number one. Mitch is still up in the top of this pack. In fact, he's gained a position off the start with Rossi falling backwards, so he's in third, definitely leading the way right now for Williams Esport. Box and Lays, though, this is a promising battle that I think will only heat up over the coming six laps. Yeah, great top three right now with Box and Lays. That one two punch, and really that's what Europe's all about right now is these two Titans in Box and Lays. And you know, Lays, after missing the first week here of Series Two, he's looking to turn it up a little bit. He knows he needs a great performance to find himself in Mexico City. I'm not worried about him in London. At the end of the year, I think you'll be okay. But you'll want to prove that, hey, there's a reason that you're, you're pushing to maybe be the GOAT, the greatest of all time in Forza RC. But Box here, 
in Series 2 has come out and proven that he's the one to beat. It's all about momentum. As you say, Scott, you know, yeah, Lays will be there at the playoffs. He'll be there at the World Finals. I'm sure he'll qualify, but how much momentum will he carry into that? How much confidence will he have in those massive events? This is when that is determined. Lap three of eight here on VIR. And Box is just leading a train around this Virginia International Speedway as Lege off on the right a little bit as they come down to the oak tree. And back on the back stretch. This is really the only time you maybe get a little breather on this track. It is, and it's a long old straight here. At, uh, at Virginia as we head down towards the roller coaster. A moment for the driver's maybe just to stretch out the fingers a little bit, make sure that they're not cramping up, uh, but also a moment to be looking in the mirrors for box with Lage closing up that gap in every braking zone. The pressure's on right now, and the question is whether box can take it. Let's look, take a look at the start of this, uh, the race that we had here, because something happened to Rossi that we're still trying to figure out. Let's bring in our man, Brian Eckberg, who's always got a second set of eyes on the track. What, what the heck happened, Brian? That's exactly what we're looking at. We're looking at that start, looking at Rossi. It seems like he had a bad start to begin with because Lays got right around him. He ended up on the outside of turn one, and we think what happened is that he just went wide and everybody else passed him. So really bad luck, bad start outside on turn one. You know how that is, you know how sharp it is. He just had bad luck. Now he's in 10th, I believe. How disappointing is that, Brian, where you're, you know, you spend time, you go through the qualifier, you go through the Sunday heat, you finally find yourself in a good podium starting position at P2 and then a disappointing turn one. Yeah, you have to wonder if this is Rossi again not being aggressive in that turn one. He don't want to push it, he doesn't want to nudge. He's going to stay outside. He pays the price for it. Yeah, take advantage of that. Appreciate it, Brian. He'll be with us throughout the day. Really keeping us in check, Allie. That's the reason we bring Brian Eckberg <laughs> along with during these races. We're halfway through four of eight. Off on the side is that That's is virus. Yeah, Veloce virus. As we're heading down to the oak tree, he was looking like he was trying to battle for position, but all four wheels going off on the inside there. He would actually probably hit the old oak tree <laughs> if it was still there. He was on a straight line for it. That was turn 10 South Bend where he went off the one of the hardest places, as I was saying, on Forza Motorsport. The reason is it's an off camber left hand. <laughs> the guy's getting stuck into each other here at the round at the roller coaster. Yeah, you get so much really momentum and velocity as you move through seven, eight, and nine that when you're coming through ten, kind of throws you for a loop. If you're not ready for it, you can find yourself doing exactly what Virus did there, was being on the inside, not able to set yourself up for turn eleven. Lap five of eight now as we head back down to turn one. And although Box hasn't looked sharp, Ali, he has been able to maintain that lead over Lege. I think Box is strong almost everywhere around the track apart from turn one. He's locking up there. He's making little mistakes, and that's a touch on a sign, giving Box just an unstable moment. I thought Lege was going to dart down the inside at the second chicane there. Not quite, but yeah, he looks strong everywhere. Turn one, a little bit weak there, a little bit wide, a couple of laps running, and that will not have gone unnoticed by G2 Leish. First sector of this track, he has not looked sharp technically, and you thought with the car getting a little unsettled there on the inside of the NASCAR bin that that might be the moment that Leish thinks about coming inside, but no. Three laps and a half to go here as we once again race down to the Complex of 11 and 12 around the old oak tree. Go Lage. I kind of wish Madison, I mean, can, can I take a tangent here? Oh. I kind of wish Madison Avenue, which is, you know, at the real VIR, was in the game. I think you almost need, instead of that just casual back stretch, you need a, a little kink, a little chicane in there uh, to make it interesting before you make that run through the roller coaster. Does. It gives a second chance for these drivers to uh, get a good run out of the corner. It's all about optimizing the acceleration of this four-wheel drive Audi, making sure you're getting that very, very fast 0 to 60 time of 2.5 seconds onto the asphalt, making it real. If you fail, the car behind has an easy overtake on the straight afterwards. Well, hold your breath, folks. Here comes Lajian Box once again down to turn one. This time it's lap six of eight as the sun sets over the Commonwealth of Virginia, little lock up there. 
from Lage, trying to keep the power down through turn one. Much better job in negotiating these corners this time through for Box. I think th that little mass, you know, mishap la uh, last time through Alley probably gained a bit of his attention. It definitely did, and you know, we've seen it so often in previous seasons with Lage. He's so cerebral, he's so calm, and he's looking here at Box, just measuring the gap. He knows that the two of them could go side by side, sure, lap on lap on lap, but there's no point in doing that. He needs to make the overtake, make it cleanly, make it once, and make it just before the checkered flag. This turbocharged machine, 711 horsepower. Screamies in the chat says, these flybys sound amazing in these Audis. Let's take a listen as they head down the back straight. Coming up on turn 14 as they head through the roller coaster. This is a part where you normally maybe see some drama, especially if you got some aggressive driving, but it's been pretty much gentlemanly through 14, 15, 16, and even 17. I think with two laps to go, things are going to stop being gentlemanly <laughs> very, very soon. Lage is going to have to force the issue here if Box won't make a mistake. But now's the time when we're going to start seeing these two set it on fire. And it's really a one-two race. We haven't jumped around a lot, and, and rightfully so, because this is what you come out to watch every week. You want to see the best of the best. And here are two of the best in the world, and Box and Lage. Of course, a rough start for Rossi is the reason how Lage jumped from three to two. There you see Mitch well back there, representing Williams Esports. But he's got a way to go before he's going to catch up today. I, I, I don't see it. I think this is a one-two race right now here in lap seven. I mean, you're absolutely right, Scott. This is where we want to be. This is what we'll be watching. For my money, there is one driver in the world who can withstand this much pressure from Lage, and that is Noble Box. There's nobody else out there who's able to do this. If you look behind you and you see the tag G2 Lage, most people will run their car off the track and then uh, have a little pride. 32 wins combined between these two drivers they are on the podium 58 times they're in series one here in 2018 and once again down the back straight just one more time and this car is a screamer there's no doubt about it just sounds amazing out on vir yeah that inline five just sounding brilliant coming out the audi lays looking for a gap there down to a hog pen box isn't going to give it to him not easily anyway as they come back to the start finish line. One more time around VIR. I'm happy you guys voted for the dry conditions here as it has been a tremendous race between these two. And you can see Lage peeking to the inside here on turn one. But Box is a nice job able to close it down, sweeping around that double apex through two up to three. This is NASCAR Ben here in the final lap. Lage wanted that box very strong on the defense into turn one. He knows he's weak there. Now it's all about the rest of the lap. One more time through each of these corners, and Lage needs some inspiration because he's lost his best chance already. Yeah, at this point, he's at the mercy of Box making a mistake. I know the, the legend, the lore of Lage would tell you that he can do superhuman things at times. But he's met his match here in 2018 behind the German, Noble Box, who finished first overall in Series 1. Doom hooking through Oak Tree one last time. Lays back on the power. A little bit of a wobble there onto the straight. It hasn't hurt him too much. He's tucked up in the draft of Box, and the two of them coming down towards the last sector. Roller coaster, hog pen. That's all there is between Box and a victory. And Mitch is just enough in striking distance that that'll be in the mind of Lage that, hey, if I throw a move here for these final three corners and I, and I don't succeed, Mitch might come by me and, and take the second place. All we do know is the podium's going to be Box, Lage, and Mitch. They've pretty much been wire to wire after the mishap by Rossi. And unofficially, 
Box will come across the line. Lage will be second. And there is Mitch coming across in third. Technically sound race on VIR. There were moments, Allie, especially through turns one, two, and three, that we were unsure if Box was going to be able to hold on for all eight laps as we welcome back to the desk Brian Eckberg and Box being Box. <laughs> box being Box. He had some pressure there. Seemed like there was moments where he was going to pull away from Lege, but they said, no, not going to have anything of it. I'm going to keep the pressure on. It may not work, but I'm going to keep the pressure on the entire race. Something about when you see that blue machine in, in your rear view, and you talked about it, the G2 tag of Lege, uh, can, you, can you hold up through all eight laps? It was a test, but he did. Brilliant, brilliant performance from Box, I think. Mm. I mean, it shows how much he's matured as well. Can you imagine Box of a year ago mm. holding off that much pressure from no. Leish? No, it would have been like me in there, just <laughs> folding under like a, like a cheap card table. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what do we attest this maturation of Box to? I mean, is it finishing behind Leish time and time again, finishing behind Roadrunner? Did he dedicate himself here in, in, in Ford Motorsports 7 that says, okay, well, this time I'm, this is going to be my year. This is going to be it. I'm going to lock in. I, I think that's exactly what he did. He said to himself, you know, this is going to be my year. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's dedicated himself to practice, to training at the gym, all sorts of different ways of giving himself that mindset, the physical ability, and, and everything that's required to really make a success of it. And it's great to see him out there. Also, I mean, for a race without an overtake, that was tense. That was, and that was exciting. It was, and, and there was some other good stuff happening in the back there. I, I, I wanted to uh, point out a couple of guys. Uh, you know, Kaiser Wolf made up seven spots at the start. So a great start for him. Um, that's going to be important points for a guy like Kaiser Wolf, who started at the very back of the race. Uh, and also uh, Rossi, of course, we talked about him at the, at, the, at the top of the show, the top of the race, showing that replay, having that off in the first corner, going down at least six spots. It looked like he was fighting back at the end. But, you know, it's not a great start for Rossi. Well, I'd love to hear you describe it turn by turn, but how about we take a look at it instead as we replay race number one here today. And you talked about the bad start for Rossi. You, you just continue to power through the week and then just through one turn, literally seven seconds into the race, you find yourself last. We all know what turn one at VIR is like. <laughs> it's deceptive, right? It's deceptively tight, decreasing radius. It's one of those turns that can get you right at the beginning of this and we have him on the outside of the turn which is where you don't want to be it was such a great performance for him in qualifying and that's kind of almost what's upsetting about it the most he was in second looked like rossi was finally going to put his flag in the sand here at the forza racing championship denied yeah we saw a little bit of kaiser wolf there i wanted to focus on, on bam seven as well you know a good fourth place finish for him but if you looked at his lap times he was almost a second off from the top three guys we know uh, Seven doesn't really like this type of car. He's not comfortable here. And you saw the top three sort of pulling away during that race. Seven sort of all alone in fourth there. He'll be one to watch, though. I mean, later on in the day, we're going to have the Sauber C9, the Mercedes Sauber C9. And that's a car which really suits Seven's driving style, a lot more of a responsive front end. So mm -hmm. definitely one to watch. I'm a C7 kind of guy myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go over to my man Bravo, who's got provisionals here at race number one. Let's go ahead and take a look at those provisional results right now. As also, we saw, I just saw Bam7 in chat as well saying that he was way off of his times. He said, my absolute worst race pace ever. Uh, so interesting to see that. But let's take a look at provisionals right now. Box out in front, you saw him and Lage battling for that one two. Also, saw a lot of people in chat loving that one two battle between Box and Lage. I think it's safe to say that that is going to be a thread throughout this series. Mitch in third, seven in fourth there, as we said. Roadrunner, not where he wants to be in fifth. And then Rossi down in eighth, also saying uh, he screwed up a bit earlier. But we got to talk about this car behind me. It's going to be a pole option that you see right now. You saw the GNX was losing in the poles to the Stradale, but uh, this car, uh, so great. You're going to have two options to vote for it for race number two, both in uh, EMEA as well as North America. But let's learn a little bit more about this Buick GNX. With a turbocharged V6 running at 16 pounds of boost, a low restriction exhaust with dual mufflers, a reprogrammed turbo hydromatic transmission with a rear custom torque bar to raise the chassis under acceleration. This 1987 Buick Regal GNX is one of only 547 ever produced and could be an F40 on the quarter mile. But why does it look like Darth Vader's helmet? 
Like so many cars from the 1980s, the GNX is built from almost childish, primitive shapes. Go to preschool, put a triangle next to a rectangle, and you've basically got that formal roof line. Do it again, and you've got the hood or the tail. It wasn't a manufacturing limitation. In the preceding decades, car design was dominated by beautiful, complex curves and ornate, organic shapes. So what changed? One of the answers, and there are many, is that car designers moved from being sculptors, literally modeling their concepts using their hands and clay, to being programmers. They used early computers to code their cars as vector diagrams. Look at films like Tron, the visuals at a laser light show, or the graphics on an old Atari console. Back then, simple shapes were all these computers could handle. But at the time, this design process was cutting edge, a new aesthetic and a technology that every car manufacturer, from Toyota with their AE86 to Lamborghini with their Countach, wanted associated with their brand. Why does the Buick Regal GNX look like Darth Vader's helmet? Because back then, this was the future. I mean, Brian, this thing is yeah. absolutely wild. Someone pointed out, I hope you guys know how rare that car is. Yes. Yes. This is a legendary Forza car, right? Yeah. And yes, this is a, it's so cool to have the GNX here right. with us today. It's, we've had race cars, we've had Indy cars in the studio, we've had all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah. This may be one of my favorites. Right. This is the, a Buick, as they say, that people actually like, right? <laughs> That's right. Of course, GNX less than 600 made. 87 was kind of the last run of the Grand National, the Grand National to end all Grand Nationals. Mm -hmm. So to have one here, I checked. It's got the serial number on the dash. It's got the limited number. I believe it's number 538 on the dash as and well. I think you were mentioning, someone was mentioning, it's got like less than 9,000 miles on it? Yes. This is a 19, a late 80s car with less than 10,000 miles Factory paint on it as well. Yeah, incredible. This thing is clean. So great to have it here uh, in the studio with us. I think we're going to talk someone into letting us drive it. Yeah, right? we got to. Yeah. Or at least start the engine. I mean, someone has to drive it out of here. It might as well be you and myself. Yeah, we'll figure it Let's out. Let's do it. Uh, we also have final results from that race already. Not too much in the way of adjudication there. You just saw the provisionals. Those results also are final. But here they are one more time. Box still out in front, but Lege, of course, pressuring him through the entire race. Mitch, seven, and then also Roadrunner there in fifth. Look for Roadrunner to try to make some moves. Of course, he's not gonna be satisfied with fifth today. I think we got a lot more Roadrunner or Williams talk to come because yeah. this is a battle that's going to continue throughout this season. Mitch versus Roadrunner, who's the top dog at Williams? It's interesting too, right? Because you had Mitch earlier in JSR kind of emerge as the top dog at JSR and Mitch sure. really cementing that Whatever team Mitch ends up on, he has pulled out on top, making a statement for sure. Let's Absolutely. go ahead and also talk about the next poll that's going to be coming up. We've got to get ready for a race number three poll. You're going to have two options here. This time it's the track selection. Are you going to Road Atlanta Full or the Bugatti Circuit at Le Mans? Here, of course, two different courses. Uh, excited to see. We've seen a good bit of Road, of, uh, Road Atlanta through the Forza RC, but we haven't seen too much Bugatti Circuit, so we'll have to see what the community is itching for. Yeah, Road Atlanta is long, but it's super fast, whereas Bugatti is real technical. Lots of, yeah. lots of corners. Every kind of corner there, right. it feels like. So, yeah, I'm anxious to see what they pick. Absolutely, of course. So go ahead, watch.forzarc.com to get in on that poll as well. But I do believe we're getting ready to head over back to the desk. going to be Scott Cole and Ali Dack. Well, appreciate it, gentlemen. Back again, and it was a a pretty exciting race number one because you talked about the the back and forth between Lage and Box. I'm expecting to see that again here on Homestead. Yeah, I think so. And I'm looking forward to seeing that battle continue uh, throughout the day. I think uh, as we head on through this uh, day of racing, we're going to see very different challenges for these drivers. And it won't always come up with the same result, especially race two, I think is going to be more suited to Lage. And with Mitch now going to be tucked up in there in third without Rossi going wide or whatever happened to Rossi there, I think Mitch will be more formidable now that Lage will also have some pressure on him, uh, which could factor in to what happens in that 2-3 that battle. Uh, you're standing next to my table with your, <laughs> with your menu items, and I'm just like, I'll take all of it. I'll have all of it. Yeah, it sounds great. Uh, <laughs> and I agree. Yeah, the interesting thing is which car it'll be in. So uh, we're waiting for those final results to get in from the poll. We're waiting for those guys to get into the lobby, get into Homestead. And when you talk about Homestead, I mean, you, you, you know, it's down in Miami. Um, it's going to be interesting based on the car because I really feel like these are two totally different vehicles. If you're one of these top three guys that, that finished in, on the podium last race, which one are you hoping that the community picks? 
Yeah, for Lage, he's going to be looking, I think, for the Buick. Uh, just because it's a very, very difficult car. And Lage is a driver who's able to handle a difficult car, very work around its problems yeah. uh, a lot better than others. Mitch as well, probably the Buick, because it understeers so much, and he's so good in understeery cars. Box, I would say probably the Lancia. Although he's looked so strong this season, yeah, it could be anything. Which car are you picking? Lancia, every time. <laughs> <laughs> the Buick's fine. The Buick's over there. We don't, we don't need to see it. It is pretty Buick. sweet. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a pretty sweet machine. And, you know, always, you know I feel a little, a little sympathy when the car that we bring in isn't the car that gets chosen. But I can always count on my North American counterparts <laughs> later on uh, this afternoon uh, finally getting the Buick out on the track. I've, I, I mean, there, there's a, a correct and an incorrect response this week, <laughs> Scott. <laughs> yeah, the Lance series is just super cool. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that a lot. Someone else who's going to be hoping, I think, for the Lance is going to be Zermatt uh, as well. He didn't have such an impressive result in race one, but he likes a lighter car. He performs better in a lighter car. So that's something that he'll definitely be sort of hoping for in race number two. And these are, these are big races here because when you're thinking about the global leaderboard right now, it is very tight and it's all about leading your way to Mexico City. And of course, Hard BR continues to get it done uh, down in Latin America. You see Box holding on for dear life to that second place. It's interesting to see later on this evening what the man from North Carolina can do, TX3 Lightning. Um, also, Roadrunner down there in fifth. He has an opportunity to make a move. No Lage on the top 12 right now. Lage didn't make it to week one's races. I think he had another engagement. He was busy. Uh, so he went through the boost arrivals. In general, the boost arrivals uh, isn't a way to replace the races, but just gives you a little booster uh, in, in case you miss out. So uh, Lage way down the order right now. He'll have plenty of opportunities to work his way back up uh, later in the season. Yeah, I mean, some of these leads... When you looked at the, you know, when you think about the points, you look at the points. I mean, it's it's razor thin. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it is. And as always, we see the top of each region starting to emerge towards the top of the table. So we've got a three-way battle between Hard BR, it's uh, Box and Lightning. So the top three drivers from LATAM, EMEA, and North America who are at the top of that table. And then a few other drivers from other regions coming in, a lot of EMEA being represented in that top 12. So it's all about that battle, kind of shadow boxing across the region. Yeah, and really that bad turn one for Rossi, you see them right there, number seven overall, that can cost him a ton of points. A ton, a ton. He will be kicking himself right now after that mistake. I know we've seen a comment from him on Twitter saying that on Twitch that he's, he's not wasn't happy with it. I mean, he just has to recover now. He just has to be putting his head down recovering. Let's take a look at the car and the track that you guys chose. Obviously, we know we're going to Homestead, and they Ooh. will. I'll, hey, you're so pumped <laughs> about this car. I'll let yeah. you talk about it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Much lighter than the Buick. Uh, a little bit less torquey. A little bit of a smaller motor. Uh, but this one can definitely put the power onto the tarmac in a way that that big piece of American nonsense cannot. Uh, it's going to be so much more interesting to watch this race. Here is Homestead, Miami. You know it's mostly known for it, what it can do in NASCAR. But we're going to be on the road side of it. Here's the grid order. Box up top. Lage is in second. Mitch is in third. Can Roadrunner make a push? Can Rossi get back into it? Those are going to be the questions as we're in the 1988. Fun fact, my first car was a 1982. <laughs> but it was a sh it was a sh uh, Chevy Silverado step side. Uh, had some good horsepower. Had a 454 in it. I yeah. mean, it, it it had some horsepower and some torque. Uh, not much on the top end speed. Let's get to it, guys. Let's go down to South Beach. It's Miami on Homestead, and we are ready to rock and roll. Box out in front, Lage, <laughs> hot on his bumper here through turns one and two, and they'll wrap around to turns three, four, and five. Really love. Three, four, and five down here on home, on Homestead, and boy, they are. Box has got to pick up the pace a little bit here. Looks like he's backing up the train a little bit. Able to come out on the five, and this is a key stretch, as you see come, some of the guys clipping the grass. Yeah, look at that front pack. Box, Lage, and Mitch really starting to uh, show their form here in EMEA already, making a small gap to Bam Seven, who uh, will be hanging it out to try and keep up there. Uh, this is going to be an awesome race. I can feel it in my bones. Well, this is the pace we're going to be at, folks. 202 horsepower. <laughs> and we can already see Mitch eyeing that outside as they come down to six, 
seven. They go wait, make their way into eight. And then at some point, this is the time that you kind of, you have to channel your inner NASCAR here because you're out on the, on the main track. Absolutely right. Lage going defensive into this fast left hand loop through the, uh, yeah, through the banking. Absolutely uh, defending his, for his life from Mitch, who's just tucked up there in the draft. I'm not saying I foreshadowed it, but I told you it's going to be a little bit different now that Lage has to worry about someone on his tail, somebody that he has to defend in. And I, I'm actually a, a decent fan of Homestead and Daytona. Lage trying to go the inside a little bit. I love when you come off the super speedway and you start to make your way into the, into the road course. That's when it gets a little... A little interesting, the, the entrances to the road circuit and the exits to the road circuit are so key. And there's such a change in the feel of the track here on Forza Motorsport 7 when you change from the outer ring into that infield circuit. The infield's very thin and crunchy. Lays looking for the lead here. And he, let's see if he can make it stick. Coming around six and seven. And it looks like he'll make it happen. Also, Mitch was able to come by Box as well. So Box goes from first to third. Boy, they are stacked up right now. And a headsy play by Mitch to, to notice that. Him. Straight back on him from Box. Up the, up the next hairpin. Very, very close <laughs> battling here as Lage starts to pull away. So Lage. Able to come through that one, not only make it stick, but get a couple car links here. Mitch able to close down a box as he was coming through, but this is the battle right now between second and third. And I was just going to say, what a heads up driving there by Mitch to notice, okay, Lazer's going, I'm going. I'm going with them too. And there was nowhere for box to sort of file back in. He had to wait for Mitch to clear. Exactly. He made it to train behind Lage, hooked up the front bumper of his car with the rear bumper of Lage's and just used the gap that he created. <laughs> JSR Devin in chat says literally not a single good thing about Homestead. Well, you are on, you know, you're close to South Beach. Yeah. You, you can head down there. <laughs> I mean, the tacos are phenomenal. But I assume he's talking about the racing. Go to the snack bar, get you some nachos. Hey, I, I love a bit of Homestead. <laughs> I like this track. It's kind of crunchy. It's got a Sebring vibe on the inside. Very sort of old feeling. The curbs are high. You can run them, but uh, you have to just run the right line. Yeah, the infield at Homestead's a cracking track. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into this later. I, 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 we'll love, get the, into this I later. love the banter, though. <laughs> Lap three of nine. Try the nachos and then get back to me. Let's take a look at the start of this race. We, it, we had Box on the pole. The front of the pack, it was Linus Stern with uh, Box leading the way from Lage and Mitch. Later on in the race, starting to come alive. Boy, Mitch look at still that. holding Box off, though. Look at that lead that Lage has accumulated through these first three laps. He's sort of off on his own now, and this is when he is the very best. It just proves how fast he is. He's just, he's gaining hundredths of a second per every corner, but that starts to add up. Next thing you know, he's 0 0.3, 0 0.4, tenths of a second ahead. Lage is one of the winningest drivers out there in the Forza Racing Championship. He wins a lot of races. He doesn't come on the podium of that many, though. He doesn't come second or third very often, but he often comes first. So if he can get ahead, he can make that gap. If he stays behind, he tends to lose it. 19 wins in Series 1 for Lage, but didn't win the big one when it came to the Seattle playoffs that closed out. That first part of the series here in Series 2, he's sort of making his debut after missing the races two weeks ago. And now it's up to Mitch and Box. Box doing a nice job of flip-flopping positions. He was in first, fell back to third on that move by Lage that really Mitch just went along with it, stayed with it. But Box has done a nice job piling back and able to grab that second which is going to be big because if Box finishes first, lays, you flip-flop him in the second, you go reverse grid in the third, you're really setting yourself up for 
who can have the most overtakes in race three, and that's what it's all about. That is exactly what it's about. Box and Lay so equally balanced in their reverse grid performances. It's going to be very, very close indeed uh, coming into that last race. Also tied on points. I think they're going to have to add up how quickly they went around the race, <laughs> add them together, I don't know, all that crazy stuff. We'll let the guys in the nerd cave worry about that. <laughs> Good to hear from Diablo checking in from F4H. And I want to get your take on this. He's like, if you miss the apex in this car by even six inches, you can be well off the track. It's not got a massive engine in it, the Lancia. As you say, you know, not a huge amount of horsepower, not a huge amount of torque. So it's all about maintaining apex speed. Roll the speed through the center of the corner, and you'll carry that speed all the way with you down the straight afterwards. What Diablo is talking about there is if you get a little bit offline, you have to decrease that speed, you're going to be losing out all the way through to the next apex. Semi hoping in the North America show that we get to see this Buick GNX able to get an opportunity to get out here on Homestead because I think, especially when you get to this point, when you're exiting you know, the inner part of the track and you're getting back on to the speedway. That's where that Buick could really move. Look at Box just getting really pushed along by Mitch. Neck and neck, matching the pace right now. The Box doing a nice job keeping that inside defensive line. And right now, Mitch's mentality will be all about making sure he doesn't knock box off the track with a silly late break a silly little bit of extra speed carried through the apex to keep it clean keep the pressure on box and wait for a solid opportunity this is a a circuit that we normally see roadrunner really excel at and he has moved himself up into fourth place so you got the williams brothers running third and fourth you can see roadrunner right there so that's big for Roadrunner, big for Roadrunner. Overtaking seven, getting himself up into there. Next up on the field is Mitch, who's been threatening for that dominant position in Williams all this time. Roadrunner's going to have his sights on his teammate. Currently third and fourth, and there you see, can, I mean, he's just waiting for Box to make a mistake. Can wait all day. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you, when we look at this circuit here, you know, 2.1 miles, of layout, where's some opportunities? Where's the overtaking chances for Mitch? The best overtaking from is the corner we're just exiting. That's turn eight. Uh, the move Mitch has been trying, he's been working on it the last couple of laps, and the reason he's a couple of car lengths back now is a kind of over-under. He wants to go wider than box on the way into the corner and straight line speed it out with a late apex of that corner. That's not really working out for him. The Lancia doesn't have that acceleration that the Buick has to give him the advantage there. Look at Leish checking out here at the front of this pack. But uh, <laughs> he, he can throw a move on him there. That's probably the best place, turn eight. But he wants to be up the inside. Make the move on the way into the corner, not on the way out, which is what he's tried so far. Lap seven of nine. Lage well out in front. So the battles between second and third, Box and Mitch. Seven has found his way back into fourth, edging out Roadrunner. And Roadrunner is trying to take that position back. You can see them going side by side. Boy, this is what you love to see. We it's might like go three, go three wide. wide. Virus is thinking about getting involved. Down towards the hip, and it's a right-hander coming up. And Roadrunner just bailing from that. He doesn't want anything to do with it. He's part of the sandwich. At that point, you want to be the bread. <laughs> Virus to the inside for Verlache. And let's listen to these pack of three Lancias as they rev up to hit the super speedway. Boy, those are some long gear ratios <laughs> as they try to power this thing up. It's a great little mid-mounted inline four uh, in this car. Sounds fantastic. As you say, not hugely powerful, 172 abstract units of torque, whatever that is. <laughs> but zero to 60 and 5.9, you guys chose in the community this car over the Buick Regal GNX that we have in the studio.
and how rare this vehicle is that does 0 to 60 in 2.5. For me, they chose correctly. This is the Lance series. It's, it's a cool <laughs> car. It's, it, and it looks fantastic. Uh, of course, coming from a sort of rally heritage, uh, Lance are doing incredible things in the uh, rally championships of the 80s. Uh, so a car that's perhaps slightly more comfortable off-road than on it, but at the same time, uh, doing a fantastic job around Homestead here. As we were saying, though, it, it, it's so much about that rolling mid-corner speed in this car. It's all about perfect lines, contain, maintaining momentum. Lay's doing an amazing job of that this race. And that inline four sort, sort of has a similar sound that maybe a, a BMW inline six would have. You know, obviously, a, you know, it sounds more underpowered um, than the, the BMW. And let's check in with Bravo. What's going on in the chat? Hey, thanks, guys. Lots of talk, of course, about just how big Lage's leader gap is. You see it on screen right now. I mean, look how far out in front it is. What are you guys seeing about Lage's race here that, that has let him just take a, a huge lead? Zero pressure. When you, when you have no pressure, it's just you're hot lapping. It's just a, I know we're on a Wednesday, but it's just a Sunday drive. I tell you what, the, the problem for Lage is that you don't get any extra points for winning by a big margin. Yeah. It's just the same point, still 20 for that win. He's way out there in the lead. He needs to cool that car down, get it down to 80%. Uh, just make sure he doesn't make any silly mistakes. At the same time, this, this is a very lage win. Take the lead, pull away, disappear into the distance. It's in, his mi in the mid-pack when he's fighting his way through cars that he tends to drop points. Final lap, nine of nine. Lage well out in front. So it's going to be the battle of second and third between Box and Mitch. Mitch has got a little bit of space now. The question is, in this final lap, can he make a run at box through turn six and seven here on Homestead? Scott Cole and Allie Tack along with you. This is race number two of three. And remember, we take the results from race one, from race two, and then we'll reverse grid that final race number three. And you guys are trying to choose between Road Atlanta, yes please, or of course, <laughs> Le Mans uh, Bugatti circuit's not bad either. Can't really go wrong with either of those circuits. It's two great tracks. Oh, fantastic uh, little little circuits we've got to uh, push that C9 Mercedes-Benz Sauber around. I'm going to go ahead and call it right here. It's going to yep. be Lage 1, Box 2. <laughs> uh, and for Williams, Mitch, he's going to be in third because once you get up on that super speedway, you know, the fast part of the track, uh, that's used for a ton of NASCAR events, IndyCar, things like that. I mean, you forget about it. If, if, if you're not making a move coming, exiting the inner part of the circuit, going on uh, to that outside part of the track as we welcome in Brian Eckberg, you can forget about it in that last little stretch. And that final corner that you mentioned is so difficult because it's such a steep camber for the car. It's easy for that car to get upset. These guys handled it with ease. Well, we, you know, we started off a box in front. But it was the move by Lage, uh, and, and Mitch tried to be a part of it. <laughs> and it was just for a couple, a couple corners that he had some success over Box. But Box, once again, showing his dominance, that he has one of the fastest pace out there. It was good to see them all sort of uh, interacting with each other, pushing and uh, working their way around. In the first race, it was a little bit of a procession, maybe, yeah. with Box and Lage putting pressure on each other. Um, good to see that Lage can throw the move, even if it was just on one car. And this is the Lage we're used to seeing. He gets out ahead and he takes off. We were looking at lap times. I think Lage might have been the only guy to touch the 131s that entire race. Yeah, 131s really fast. Of course, he was hot lapping uh, for, for majority of that. Let's take a look at the replay here in race number two. That Lage looked all so dominant at one point here. Uh, and I'm sure we'll maybe take a look at it. We got three wide. Yeah, and we saw a little bit of contact there between Box and Lage too. It didn't seem to affect anything, but I guess Box just broke Broke late there, it felt like. And here's uh, Seven and Box and Williams Mitch trying to make something happen for second place here. Um, as we saw, this would this eventually back out. Roadrunner, and I believe this is Seven we're looking at as well here. Yes, it is. Uh, seven getting around Roadrunner, but here's that moment, Scott. Three wide. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. I guess, I guess red was a popular color <laughs> in 1982. Uh, Roadrunner. Although he was in fourth, fifth, uh, you know, sort of in that middle of the pack, there was times, I don't know if it's the track, but I, I probably think it's more of the car. Mm -hmm. he's, he's uncomfortable in these kind of vehicles. 
He looked uncomfortable. He looked, uh, I mean, at the same time, he was, he, was, he was buoyant. He was moving forward. Sure. Maybe it wasn't his perfect his perfect car. He does so well in those P-Class, LMP1, four-wheel drive, mm. beasties, uh, and tends to maybe turn it down a little bit in road cars or rally cars, as we saw there. Well, Bravo's got the provisional results, so let's go over and check in with my main man, Bravo. Let's go ahead yeah, and take a look at those provisional results. We'll bring up the leaderboard right now after that race. Of course, adjudication is still in progress. But as you saw, Lage out in front, and boy, did he have, ever get comfortable. I saw the co-pilot in chat said he really laged it on thick. I don't know about the pun, but I'd have to agree with you. Box there in second, able to hold that down. Having to play a lot of defense throughout those last laps of the race there. Mitch in third, Roadrunner still there in fourth. Also saw Diablo in chat chiming in, saying, having seen Lage drive at a land, he is a robot. It is crazy how consistent and smooth he is, and he looked good there. But as we talked about, guys, Lace is going to have to perform really throughout online if he wants to, to, to sit in a good position coming to Mexico City. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, and I also agree with uh, Diablo out there. I mean, when you give, you just, just it was this much. The, the whole race, it was just, it was just a millimeter or two that, you know, as yeah. far as the screen goes. I know if, if you talk real world, I mean, you're talking <laughs> about several feet there, but that's all Lage need to just one move, and he's cruising for the rest of the, the rest of the race. Uh, but you have to be Lage to pull that off. You know, there's only, like we were saying before, you have to be the right driver to be able to make that work. Lage, yeah, he threw one move on, he made it look very easy, but he's probably the only driver out there who had the pace to be able to pull away from Box, pull away from Mitch, which is nuts on Forza Motorsport 7. And, and Bravo, if these results continue to hold, we're in for a heck of a race three. Uh, we really are, of course. Uh, we've been talking about it since the, since the beginning of the, the series uh, this year. Lage and Box uh, going back and forth. Box there, consistent so far this year, but Lage really proving that he can get out in front. Like we said, we've got a lot more to come. Race two, final results, race number three, as well as some Forza community news. Don't go anywhere. We're going to go to a quick break from the Forza Racing Championship sponsors. <laughs> All right, welcome back, guys. Of course, now let's we'll talk about some news here in the Forza RC as we wait on those final results. One of the big ones. Everybody left AMS. It's a ghost town. <laughs> yeah, AMS, uh, the home of Roadrunner uh, previously, is now, as you say, a ghost town. The entire team seems to have dissolved, and uh, all of those drivers, Europa, Sterilizer, yep. McQueen, names that we're familiar with, are now privateers. Maybe looking for a team, maybe looking just to do something for themselves, Ali. Yeah, and what a shame it is to see a team disappear. I mean, first of all, you've got to sort of, um, you've got to respect the amount of effort that goes into making these teams and, uh, and maintaining them, you know, supporting all the drivers out there. A big shame to see the team disappear, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, like a kind of forest fire almost. <laughs> it's true. It, it yeah. clears the way for new life. Yeah, it really does. I'm, of course, now that uh, all these players are out there, I think there's going to be competitive offers. And I think speaking of, I don't think we're naming names, but we're even hearing rumors about, right, top North American drivers getting offers from top uh, organizations and yes. rejecting them, right? I mean, so it speaks a lot about the quality of competition now that you have top drivers who are really assessing their offers and shopping around. Well, you talk about the silly season in Formula One, which is when all the drivers move. It's typically towards the end of the Formula One season. In Forza RC, silly season seems to be all season yes, yes. because these teams are making moves, drivers are becoming independent, and they have a chance to move on. They're looking for the right opportunities, mm -hmm. and that's what I love for these AMS guys. Now, none of these guys are at the caliber of Roadrunner in terms of skill, but they're young, right. they got a lot of time, they're going to improve, and they're going to they have a lot of opportunity going forward to get with a great team. Certainly excited to see what comes for them this year also. But uh, also before we get into the final results, I want to also mention, of course, Forza Monthly. You guys have another stream coming up. Absolutely. So Forza Monthly is our monthly Forza show where we talk about everything that's happening across the Forza, the world of Forza. The next show is on August 6th. 
Uh, it's going to be at 1 p.m. right here in the studio. We're going to be talking the August update for Forza Motorsport 7. Lots of Forza Horizon 4 news and, of course, talking about the Forza RC. So don't miss it. This is episode, what, three now? This is episode three. Right. Uh, we're going to have a special car in the studio just like we have the GNX today. Mm -hmm. uh, some special guests from around turn 10 and it's going to be a fantastic time. Can't wait. Excellent. Sounds like final results are ready. Let's go ahead and pull those up from race number two that we just saw in that Stradale. No penalties here. So once mm -hmm. again, the results will stick a little bit cleaner this week. We saw some rough racing <laughs> and right. some bumping in EMEA last week, and looks like everyone's toned it down, a little bit more respectful. Lage out in front by a long shot box, holding on to that second, another great performance from him. And then the boys from Britain, Mitch and Roadrunner, excuse me, boys from the Great Britain right there, uh, Mitch and Roadrunner in third and fourth. But now that race number two is, uh, and final results are in, we're getting ready right away for race number three. Excited to see exactly what this is gonna hold. Uh, but we have the leaderboard so far, of course, to tally the results from those first two races. Keep in mind, each week in the Wednesday showdown, three total races where all the results will be summed. Lege now here out in front. I'm not sure if that's an official first. We'd have to know about track times exactly to know that's between right. Lege and Box who's first yeah, and second. They're tied on points. If you know somebody's gonna win this, you know, points, uh, we still got a race to go. A reverse grid race, right. let's not forget. Uh, interesting to see those guys swapping wins. This is what you expect from Forza RC and yep. Mia, those two guys at the top of the heat. Yeah, and here's the question, right? Between Box and Lage, right? Who is going to be more comfortable? Neither of them necessarily known as reverse grid monsters. That's so right. who can get just a bit further in this last race? It's going to be exciting. We're going to get right into race number three right away. Scott Nally, over to you. Appreciate it, gentlemen. I think that's a great point Bravo brought up. Neither of these guys are super aggressive at the back. They gave an opportunity to change the narrative, though, here. They do. They do. I mean, speaking of changing narratives, uh, after losing out on season three at Le Mans, Leish has never lost at Le Mans in 2018. So this guy is going to be coming to a track that he's never, ever lost at. Oh, my. All right. Well, we're getting ready for race number three here. Let's take a look at the cars and the tracks. Of course, they're going to be in that C9, that Mercedes-Benz 1989. was a great year, and this is a cracking motor vehicle. It's incredible. Group <laughs> C racing, and everyone loves it on Forza Motorsport. The C9, of course, a car which performs at the top of P class, and so one that um, these drivers will be very familiar in the circuit to the south as well. Hey, you uh, and I have been there. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, went we, there, we yeah. hung out there one time. We That's, still out there. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's not the whole thing here, but there is some of the most famous curves and corners and turns that you'll find not only in France, but the entire world of motorsports and watch out for turns four and seven who is going to be able to tame this c9 beast here is the reverse grid zermatt at the one mr jack at two but let's go ahead and go all the way down to the bottom it's mitch box and Lage in 10 11th and 12th tip of the cap to box he's actually in 11th that might be an advantage and the lights are out here at le mans we're on the bugatti circuit and let's get going. This C9 as they race their way down through the Dunlop curve into the Dunlop chicane. And not seeing much change. If you're going to see any change, it's going to be happening much more closer to the back as these guys rumble up and around the curve coming down to the La Chapelle. And that's what you need to watch. A little lock up. Going three wide. And that looked like that was massive, massive crash. There's at least three. Roadrunner and Rossi there. Yeah, off on the side. Saw Rossi, saw Roadrunner. Not sure who the third guy was. That was seven. Yep. Bam, seven got caught up in the carnage as well. And so that'll move. Oh, boy. That's not a good sign here for Kaiser. With. There's a lot of red in that damage. Yeah, the one you want to look at there is second down on the right. Engine, 100%. That car is not going to be moving very quickly at all. You're going to have to limp it back to the pit lane. But in a sprint race, 10 laps around the Bugatti circuit, his race is over. Hey, you're going to be last anyway, so might as well fix that Im image. Image damage. Engine damage. <laughs> hey, it's a little bit of image damage, too. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you that. 10 laps in total. You can see Roadrunner there. Well, it's the second visit for Roadrunner to Le Mans that he's uh, found himself in the wall at. Last time out, it was the final race at the Seattle playoffs. This time, just the first lap at the Bugatti circuit. Managed to navigate his way into the pit lane just about. <laughs> Here we are with Lage now, though. Lage started to look pretty buoyant on a reverse grid race. Good effort from him. Well, it took some carnage and chaos 
to get him up into seventh. There's Mitch. He's in sixth. Box is in fifth. So our trio of champions have moved themselves up. And Mitch gets squirrely on the outside. Upset car that allows Lage to come by on the outside. And so now Box and Lage in fifth and sixth as Mitch. Boy, it looked like he just caught the curb just a little bit, maybe a little on the grass, but he unsettled that C9 very quickly. It's so easy to misjudge your speed at La Chapelle. Take a little bit too much, and that outside apex will be there. That outside curb will be there to eat you up. That's what unsettled Mitch's car, and that's what saw him spinning around. Little love tap from behind. You see Zermatt Chris. Hey, Chris. First time seeing him in color pictures today. Uh, they are running one and two right now. Chris trying to throw a move to the inside. Here's Mr. Jack, a little Ooh. wheel lockup, and those two will get taken out. Mr. Jack putting his nose in where it did not belong there. It's always going to be an accident with Chris unsettled, and that's Rossi and Mr. Jack getting into it now. Carnage here in the battle for sixth. Boy, let's catch our breath for a moment. Bravo, what the heck is going on? Take a look at chat. Sterilizer <laughs> actually in the chat with us. He's saying it's almost inevitable, these fast, twitchy cars on a narrow track in close quarters that we're going to have these crashes. We should also keep in mind, right, this, this C9 along with the Peugeot in 89 are the reason one year later that the chicanes were added, right? So the top speed of these cars on the infield Bugatti circuit, what do you guys think? I mean, is this kind of inevitable that we're going to see some bumping like this on these corners? Yeah, we, we, we saw a little bit down in, in LATAM early on that we knew there was going to be a little bit of fun, well, for us, Fun for us and the viewers, but these drivers are going to be put through the test here on Le Mans. I mean, it's, it's an incredible test of their skill. A mid-mounted twin turbocharged V8, 800 horsepower, 600 foot-pounds of torque. This car is an absolute handful. They have no traction control, these drivers, no assists at all, and they have to modulate that power to get it onto the apex. I'm not surprised to see a few people not in entirely in control of their car. Well, these two started at the back. But now they're in third and fourth. Let's welcome in Brian Eckberg and uh, quite the start to this one. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a lot of stuff happening since the start, but we wanted to have another look at this start because we saw the great start from Zermatt uh, in that weird mime driver gear. I don't know why people choose that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, you, you saw coming down to that first double apex corner, um, you saw a lot of cars get involved. A couple of cars would spin out of this. You see, I think it's Kaiser Wolf there in the middle and then JSR Rossi kind of spins back in, and you already see some smoke from the tires there, and you see at least three spins. There's seven, there's Kaiser Wolf, there's Roadrunner, there's Rossi all spinning, and you see Rossi making contact with Mitch there. So a lot of stuff happening in that first few corners affecting this race. Well, Brian, a lot to digest. I appreciate it as we head into lap four of 10, and uh, pretty much you saw Kaiser Wolf in yeah, Bam 7 pretty much be used as like a pinball. <laughs> just, just, just ping ponging between these C9s and then eventually dumping themselves up on the side. Game over. I tell you what, the start of this race was chaos, but now we're reaching the midpoint. It's very, very simple indeed. The two leaders on points, Box and Lage, are neck and neck in the battle for third, and they're about to meet the two leaders. Well, Zermatt. You want to prove that you belong? Here's your opportunity. Because here is Virus Box in Lege. You know if, I mean, if, you, if you're starting on the top in the reverse grid, you know you haven't had the pace throughout the day. And uh, these guys, of course, repping TPR. Love the new paint these guys have unveiled. And he's actually... Looking pretty good, right? in fact, right now. A little bit of lockup. But you can tell he, he knows he needs to have more pace than he's had in the early two races. I think that's why you saw a little lockup there because, uh, you know, going into those uh, that chicane a little faster than normal. I mean, it's great we're talking about Zerm out here. We haven't really mentioned him yet today, but of course, one of the driving forces behind TPR's you know, reinvigoration in the last few months. So good to see Zerm out here. He's leading the race right now. Um, we're only at the midpoint, though, and there's a whole lot of very fast drivers behind him, uh, including, and we haven't mentioned this yet, Mitch in fifth place, definitely in with a shout here. Oh. As he get into, gets into Lege. Yeah, Lege pushed to the side. That was Mitch. Good job by Mitch backing off there, but that's going to push Lege back as they 
We're coming out of six, going down toward that chicane of seven and eight. Mitch trying not to push the issue once he got into Lays there. So Box is in third, Lays is in fourth. And you think right now, if even this holds for Box, he might be the overall winner. In that little touch, Mitch on Lays has given Box just the, uh, the whisper of a chance to make an attacking move on the cars in front. He doesn't have to defend Lege off right now. There's a couple of car lengths there padding, and he can maybe throw something on Virus here and get a car between him and Lege, which will be his number one priority right now. When you talk about 800 horsepower, you're going to see some wheel spin. You're going to see some lockup, especially on the mile. We talk about such a technical track. You see a lot of different corners and curves. But Zermatt, who has zero wins, he did find himself in one podium this year, is trying to defend a couple champions that are in his rearview mirror. What a first win it would be to take one, to steal one away from Box, Lage, Mitch, and Virus, four of the very fastest in the world, let alone EMEA. Have to hold on pretty tight though, so Matt, here, because there's plenty of people I mean, who love that position. It's hard to count these as overtakes because. I really just feel like Box and May, uh, Mage, Box and Lage were, I've been playing too much Warcraft, have been, <laughs> you know, moving themselves up based on the mistakes of others. And you can even count that as one as Lage moves into third. And now he sets his sight on Virus. Lage proving, well, dispelling a few ghosts here, we should say. The a driver who hasn't performed brilliantly in these reverse grid races, and we've commented on it more than once that maybe he's a weak driver moving through the pack, but making it look very easy here. Well, Box has fallen back. Mitch is in th fourth now. We see battling back and forth. Box able to take that fourth position back from Mitch, so that didn't last long. And now they're side by side. Mitch on the inside of La Chapelle. You have to think he's going to be able to defend that fourth position here. There's a very long right-hander and a whole lot of advantage for him as Box throws another move, though. He does not want to give up that position. And here is Lage up ahead, but look at this battle between Mitch and Box. Mitch finally, well, I say it, <laughs> and they lost a little bit of momentum there, but Mitch finally able to secure that fourth position. Let's take a listen to this 800 horsepower, this Mercedes C9. Here, the throttle control, the driver's just feeding in the power, limiting the amount that the engine's putting onto the asphalt. Those big rear tires are able to withstand a lot, but not everything that that engine can offer. Mid-mounted engine, twin turbocharged V8, 0 to 60 in 2.7. And for 1989, that'll work. Two and a half laps to go. Box in fifth, Lage trying to battle for second. He's looking left, he's looking right, trying to find space on this circuit. But Virus has all of his cards covered, it looks like, as Lage tries it on the outside again. It's a difficult move to pull off this one. And I know my man Race Boy's listening in the back. And Evan, talking to you. Race cars. Lots of horsepower, big wings, man. That's what I want to see out there on the circuits. <laughs> Not a Buick, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. I, I'm all right. I'm all right with the GNX out there. Hopefully we'll see it here in our afternoon to evening session in North America. Lap 8 of 10. Scott Cole and Ali Tack along with you. This is the final race of the day for Europe. And as I just mentioned, North America coming up a few hours from now. What a great job Zermatt's done here. We just had a little look at him as Box gets into the rear of Mitch, pushing him around the back of the track. That is a massive move. Boy, the adjudicators are going to have to take a look at this. The marshal's going to have their hands full with that one. Box had had enough. Zermatt somehow still holding on. And we've had some clean racing today. Uh, that was good. That's going to be interesting. When we get past, yeah, I don't like the mime gear. I'm, I'm, I'm with. 
I'm with Brian Eckberg oh. on that one. A couple of laps remaining, and Lage is looking at Zermatt now. This would be his first win, remember, so Zermatt doing an amazing job to lead this race so far. Can he hold on for just two more laps to take that top step of the podium? He hasn't done it before, so uh, I'd love to see it, but Lage looking predatorial here on the rear of that Sauber. Yeah, you can tell he wants back-to-back -back wins. It's not only to be on the t podium, he wants to be on the top of it. I mean, he currently knows just by looking at the ticker, that box is falling off. I mean, not all the way off, but you know, he's, he's certainly back in fourth place. You know, right now you pretty much have secured the overall victory uh, here in round two of series two, but he's not satisfied with that. He is just barreling down on Zermatt right now. I remember last race, he was out there in Homestead lapping with a massive lead as though there was someone right behind him pushing like crazy. Lage does not switch off, doesn't know how. And remember, he has never lost at Le Mans, at least in 2018. Well, the final lap, 10 of, 10 of 10. Let's check in with Brian. Very quickly, I wanted to show a moment between Mitch and Box uh, that caused Mitch a couple of different spots. Uh, here's Mitch racing hard against, trying to make up the spot, and then you can see he spins there. What happened was Box seemed to have touched in there. He's racing virus hard. You see Box come in, tap him there, right there, and it spins uh, Mitch around costing him at several spots, so bad news for Mitch. Yeah, we were talking during the commercial break. You have some exposed rear tires there on that Mercedes C9, so if you get a little bit of that nose in there, you can, you can cause uh, not only damage, but you can obviously raise the chaos level. You can absolutely in Lage doing just that, raising the chaos level for Zermatt because he's taken that lead. It was only a matter of time. I, I, did, did anyone think this was not going to happen? He had half a lap. <laughs> he might have just made it. He might have made it. But Zermatt, not long left, and he's going to need uh, to throw a move onto Lage very quickly here. Well, for majority of those laps, Virus was sort of the buffer between Zermatt and Lage. Once Virus was out of the picture, you knew Lage. Had the, I mean, he's had the fastest pace the entire time, and unofficially, and I want to use that word, it is Lage Zermatt Virus Box. One, two, three, four. Rossi in fifth. And my, oh my, that final little run there was, uh, woo. It's good stuff. <laughs> I, I'm okay with that. Some overtaking <laughs> on the final lap. Brian, we'll take that every time. Overtaking on the final lap, uh, lots of good racing there. A car that these guys were struggling with a little bit. Contact means everything. We saw that in a couple of spots. And here's Lage sort of undermining everything we've said about him so far. Uh, proving that from the back, yeah, no, I'm here. I'm going to make a statement drive. But, I mean, do we not agree that he got some help getting up there? Because this wasn't true, like, overtaking, overtaking, overtaking. This was, okay, cars are spinning out of control. It's sure. getting wild here. But it's racing. It, and they're just racing through. Yeah. I, that I agree with. Yeah. There's, a, there's a whole bunch of different stuff I want, I want to throw in here. Remember Lage getting caught up in the accident at the Invitational sure. at, at Laguna Seca? Very similar cars. This time around, he's patient, waits back in the pack, and lets them have the accident. Remember him crashing at Le Mans last year? That's right. You know, fool me once, Yeah. right? This year, he never loses at Le Mans. Lege, like a velociraptor, <laughs> <laughs> is learning. <laughs> Lege laughs in the face of pressure, says ghastly weirdo on the chat there. I love it. But, you know, he, I think he was feeling really good coming out of race two when he showed all of that pace. He's like, and remember, he's, vo he's racing for the global leaderboard. He wants as many points as he, as he can possibly get. So uh, no surprise here. I mean, we're surprised of the way he did it, but no surprise that he's racing hard. After missing week one, he's come back here in race uh, in round two here of series two, and he's proven to be really tough. Let's take a look at the replay here. And our final race of the day for EMEA, and you saw it off the start. When you get four wide, things are going to happen. And four, at least four cars collected there. Mitch got lucky there to get away from that. Um, but Lage was, as, as Ali was saying, patient, just sort of stalking in the back, waiting for the good news to arrive. Just that couple of car lengths back doesn't hurt you too much in terms of lap time, but it gives you a safety padding if the cars in front have an accident. And let's not forget, good drive from Zermatt. 
great drive. Great from drive from Zeta. He needs those points. Um, held really well there. Obviously, provisional results and all of that. But um, I liked what I saw. I thought he had a shaky start there at the beginning, but um, he made it stick. He looked like he was under a lot of pressure from Virus, especially at the start. Sure. But he managed to absorb that, soak it up into his driving, and just keep his keep his pace very, very consistent. And I'm not trying to besmirch Virus at all, but mm -hmm. the, the pressure that Lage can apply compared uh, to Virus is it's a different level. It, it just is, and it showed. If it was a nine lap race, he'd be <laughs> on top of the podium right now. The only bad thing was it was ten laps. That's right. Yeah. Well. You got to race all 10 laps. You got to race the entire thing. And Lays proved it by doing just that. We had several pits. It was wild. We had guys in the spin cycle, but Lays ends up getting done, uh, at least provisionally, right, Bravo? That's right, of course, Lays is so strong once again, kind of making us eat our words a bit as we take a look at the provisional results, talking about how he and Box necessarily aren't monsters of the reverse grid, but my oh my, as you guys talked about during the race, Lays was not happy with second. Gets in front of Zermatt. I saw Sterilizer actually in the chat saying, okay, just one more lap for Zermatt. Just keep the line. And, and as that came into the chat, he's like, I think I spoke a bit too soon. You guys called it perfectly though during the race. Lege, not happy even with second. Even though he would have came out on top today with second, he wanted every point he can this season. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and the interesting thing as we, as you think provisionally, I don't think that, I don't think Box is going to be in fourth when all is said and done. I, I think that's uh I think that spin out of Mitch is going to cost him. And I, I want to I want to talk about this because Box, you know, we've talked about the confidence. We've talked about the confidence we've seen in his driving this year. But is that confidence turning into arrogance now? Is that taking that step from being a great driver, a conscious driver around other cars, to thinking I deserve that position before I even make the move? So Bravo, we we're with you provisionally, but we don't think it's going to stick. Yeah, actually, Obla Derek on, in the chat as well asking, will there be a penalty for that spin that we saw from Mitch? So uh, maybe a little bit more adjudication work uh, for the team during that last race, of course, when you take those C9s off of the full circuit de la Sarthe and put them in the Bugatti circuit, things net out uh, a, a bit differently, of course. Let's get ready, though, now to check in with our Champ versus Champ series. You guys saw the intro last week, Joseph Newgarden versus Tanner Faust community voting heavily in favor of Tanner Faust, but that first challenge is ready. We're gonna go ahead and check out, see where those guys are at. So for this challenge, I've chosen the 1985 Renault 5 Turbo 2. Now to be honest, I don't know a lot about this vehicle, but I know 1985 was the year Tanner turned 30, which makes him very old. 12. I was 12 in 85. Well, there you have it. It's still a classic, and we're going to race it. For this challenge, I've chosen a track that I've actually seen you drive on. I saw you uh, take the championship on this track, so I thought it'd be special for you. Maybe I was hoping it'd bring back some butterflies. Well, I have chosen a Renault 5 Turbo. Yeah, it's nicknamed the Widowmaker. I mean, these things are epic. You know, it's uh, they all-wheel drive, revolutionized rally racing, but it was very dangerous. They, they became illegal pretty soon, and you're, you'll find out why. I love the fact that you were hiding behind this vehicle as well as I was trying to I wasn't talk so to much, Smack. I wasn't hot. I wanted to see what kind of rear brake package I had on because that was a problem with these cars. I wouldn't hide behind a car. This is just weird. You know, this is this is actually one of my favorite tracks. Oh, that so. sucks. How's the car? You know, it's, it's very stable, and now I'm off the road, and it's got good suspension travel, <laughs> very soft landing. And this wasn't the best lap, so I'm gonna need to concentrate on this next one. Are you saying that I should shut up? Yeah, in an Indy car, you're generally flat all the way up this hill. Short sure wheelbase in this thing, huh? The Renault 5 doesn't like that. <laughs> it's not a fan of the flat up the hill. Now it's rally style. Now we're talking. It's actually very drivable. That was awesome. Welcome to all-wheel drive. Did you ever pick up NASCAR terminology? Yeah, I've heard some really interesting... Oh, damn it. You're talking to me about NASCAR. <laughs> I'm trying to do this thing. You know, I, I always love the terminology, paint the line. You know, so if, if the car was working really well, you could paint the line, you could keep it down on the apron. Hmm. If it wasn't working well, it was pushing, you couldn't paint that line good enough. That looked pretty good. I, I don't know. I'm not as confident in my lap time. I feel like you you might pull one out here on this one. It's easy to overdrive these all-wheel drive cars. I like how uh, 
recoverable it is. You know, you can really get out of shape and just bring it back. Look at that. You are, you are for sure oversteering and All right, so there are the first victory, of course, for Joseph. But we'll have to see exactly how that plays out between these two guys. It's an interesting series. You know, these guys are both tremendously fast in their own right, in yeah. their own disciplines. But here we are in Forza. We spoke about this last time. We know Joseph is a, an old school Forza guy. Tanner is relatively new to the scene. I think we all kind of think Joseph has the upper hand here, but you never know with Tanner. You never know. You never know. I mean, he was telling me just before the show in Seattle about how to jump a VW yes. over the Great Wall of China. <laughs> At breakfast. Right. right? Yeah. And, like, and speaking with incredible expertise on yeah, that. Right. So you, you never know with Tana. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually explaining, right, if you don't hit it just this point, you're flying into the Great Wall of China with, yeah. with your new Beetle. So, <laughs> Which yeah. they don't like when you do that. No, actually, frowned upon. Yeah. Frowned upon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but let's see. Of course, in this last race, we saw some really great results. Uh, Zermatt able to hold on just until the last second. Uh, but Lege pulls it out. Incredible stuff from Lege, and it's great to see so early on, right? Because there's a lot of racing to do yet before yeah. Mexico. That's right. Lege knows he's going to get there, but the fact that he's pushing as hard as he is is really great to see from him. Well, wasn't it something new as well? Wasn't it something mm. new to see Lege being so successful um, in a reverse grid race, navigating his way through a pack? And I mean, like I was saying just a minute ago, every single lesson that we've seen Lege learn uh, was applied there, mm. and he took that lesson and, and made you know, great results from it. If this is what Lege does after a week off, maybe oh, yeah. you should take next week off and come back yeah. strong for four <laughs> because he is dominating today, both in pace and aggression, racing clean and making it, making it count. Yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at also the race two leaderboard to see exactly where we were before race number three to see where the points were netting out as the adjudicators do the math in the back. Another thing we got to point out, there was a time, right, when Box was still leading Lege in that race, right? But Lay's making big moves. But here's a reminder where we sat after race number two. Zermatt, of course, they're uh, first in the reverse grid, uh, so able to finish second there. So we'll see exactly where he nets out. But of course, between Lay's and Box, Lay's comes out in front first provisionally. But interesting to see where Box is going to net out after maybe a penalty there. I mean, and, and what a sloppy move from Box. What a, what a funny little clumsy moment and something that we wouldn't normally see. I mean, maybe Box previously a little bit of a shy driver, mm -hmm. and that was a very brash moment. It was a very brash moment, and, uh, you, you know, the, the commenter in the, in the chat said it earlier, will there be a penalty? I think so much hinges on that. We saw the incident at the beginning, too, that took out four or five drivers, including right. Roadrunner and Mitch. Right. There may be something coming out of that. We've heard that this adjudication period is going to take some time, so you know they're looking at everything. Right. Yeah, Zermatt, of course, in the chat as well, saying so close, so close to finishing that one out. But let's go ahead and also take a look at some liveries here. Now, Brian, of course, you guys at Turn 10, some awesome uh, livery competitions mm -hmm. throughout the decade. So as we race through these decades each week, I believe you guys are doing a contest each week for each show. Yeah, I love this theme that we have with this series of the Forza RC going through the decades. You know, we had 60s and 70s. Now we're in the 80s, 90s and the 2000s still to come. Well, we've got a, a livery contest happening in Forza Motorsport 7 right now where you can design some decade specific liveries and we'll show them off here on the stream. And I think we have some fantastic examples we can look at right now. Yeah, go, let's go ahead and take a look at those uh, here. Uh, some great liveries for, first of all, here's the SCS Scream. He's coming in with, with the beautiful 80s livery. And I believe that's on the 90 Quattro as well. That's right. Uh, and this is the, uh, it's great that we started with because this is the theme of the week. He just took the theme that, that our brilliant graphic designers have created and put it on that Quattro. Doesn't it look fantastic? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so 80s, so loud. It's, it's, you just don't see colors like that anymore. It's no, true. it's a shame too. Uh, very, as you would say, synthwave. Very synthwave. Here we go, take a look at uh, Red Bantha's uh, skin here as well. It looks fantastic. Of course, this is uh, modeled off of the classic Porsche Le Mans livery on the 962C, I think it is, Ali. Is that right? Could be. Could be. Could cool. <laughs> I think that's right. Uh, but yeah, classic livery. Ali, there's a story to this one. This is a, an incredible one from, uh, from Buddy Munter. What a what a bright, <laughs> what a bright thing. I think I recommend you don't look directly at it for too long, right. yes. uh, especially without sunglasses. But Team Racing 80 is an actual racing team that he built this livery off of. So uh, fantastic job from him. It's definitely got that, that vibrant 80s feel to it as well. I mean, look at this private cluster. I mean, this thing looks so good. The Space Invader livery, beautiful bright colors. I love how he's, what he's done with this as well. 
fantastic. This is much more in my realm of expertise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> slamming, uh, slamming space invaders, and uh, yeah, all the all the cool little Pac-Man stuff the, in there the as well. the wheels make it on this one. Those bright green, lime green. You know, that's. Nothing. I hardly noticed them. <laughs> that's right. They're very subtle. Hard, hard to notice. <laughs> all right, the ice rabbit design. Look at this. Of course, it's on the GNX. We've got one here in studio. We it's should do that to this car um, right here. I, I think the owner <laughs> would be fine with it. Right? No, he'd be fine with it. He'd yeah. be fine with it. Look at this. The Gremlins theme. Uh, looks fantastic. Normally, sometimes you see a Vader theme. Actually, the GX we have here, for anyone with a keen eye has seen, there's a Vader front plate, mm -hmm. and there's actually a Vader uh, license plate frame. There you see there it, it actually right there. Nice. Uh, of course, uh, this car really known as the Darth Vader's helmet of automobiles. What happens if you add water to Vader? Uh, we'll find out later. Let's just okay, try we'll, later. We'll do some I'm research. not worried at all. Okay, well, <laughs> wow, <laughs> but look that at delivery this. is amazing. It is, we're ending here with the this is the 80s montage brought into a livery. We, right. we, got, we got to make sure we point out everything that's, that's, that's here on this Ferrari. We got the MTV logo. I see it. We got the RoboCop. Ali, I'll let you walk us through some as well. Uh, Kermit the Frog there uh, on the right hand side. Uh, E.T. We, we missed one. The Rubik's Cube, the Nike Swoosh. Yep. Outrun. Outrun. Yeah. With E.T. MJ with Michael Jackson, Smooth Criminal. I think there's yes, there we is. Have Prince, is. the MJ. <laughs> Top and of course, Gun. The Top the Gun logo. That's awesome. Too good. Uh, this big is how all F40 should look. Yeah. And there's a poll also <laughs> live, I believe, if you want to watch that ForzaRC.com to select which is your favorite. So make sure to head over there and vote on which of those, which of those you like most. But my goodness, fantastic results from the livery contest. Yeah, and guess what? We've got more coming because the 90s contest is open now. That'd we'll be, be doing, that's open in, uh, it's open now, I believe, mm -hmm. and we'll be showing that off in two weeks. And then the 2000s. So if you are inspired by this, go check it out. Go, go submit a livery contest. Who knows? Maybe your work will be appearing right here in two weeks. Right, you can get it right on the show. It sounds like we have final results from that last race. Let's go ahead and pull those up right now because we want to see exactly what happened. Box ah. does get the five second penalty, which in race number three is, uh, is, is quite a result, especially if we look at the battle that was between Lage and Box. Keep in mind, you had Box in about third and Lage in fourth at one point during this race. So, Ali, it's a very different finish here in race number three. It is. It looks like there's a little bit of justice there for Mitch, who maybe was unfairly spinned um, as he pops up just ahead of Box there. Big winners as well, of course, of Rossi and Chris, who uh, get a position each there from the penalty. And you got to feel for Roadrunner and Seven, those guys caught up in that early incident in the race, uh, missing out on a lot of points mm -hmm. there when those guys are traditionally pretty good at reverse grid races. Yeah, I mean, Roadrunner is so, someone you usually see carving his way through the pack, doing a great job. Mm -hmm. It was that crash at the start. There's really no recovering from it uh, when the race is uh, uh, that short. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go ahead and take it to the final leaderboard then from today's EMEA races. This is series two, round two. Here's where everything netted out. We talked about an earlier alley. You can penalize, but you can't give back. This is one of those rare scenarios where actually the penalty does give back to Mitch. It does give back to him. Uh, Mitch still losing out to box by 10 points there, uh, but that comes from his, his performances earlier on in the day. Lage though. What a run how, from him. How well has he done? Yeah. It, it really, really great. Stepping up where it counts. Didn't necessarily have the strongest race one. We saw him there really not able to make the move on Box. We saw him wanting to cut inside several times. Box looked strong, but Lage really made a count, Brian, in those last two races. Absolutely. He did what he needed to do. He did what we said he needed to do. He needed to come in here and be a different Lage, a Lage that doesn't necessarily drive from the front. But when he did get up front, he proved his pace. I want to point out Zermatt, too. He's got to be feeling good about an eighth place overall. Absolutely. One point going into race three, getting that second place, puts him up an eighth place oh. over. And doesn't overall. that doesn't that result say so much about his driving as well? He's yep. somebody who you know started off towards the rear of the pack today, couldn't make his way up through the field, maybe on pace alone. But give him the positions, and that guy can defend. Right. He can race like crazy. Yep, absolutely. To, to have one point in the first race, zero in the second, coming in, Right, with the 12th spot in the reverse grid to hold on to that fantastic result from Zermatt. Box is gonna be pretty happy though with that second place, but we talked about how much it really Lage made it matter in terms of points. Lage could have ended that race anywhere ahead of Box mm -hmm. and won today, yeah. but instead he takes first while Box is all the way down there and it actually leads 15 points over Box. It's a big result for him. Remember as well, all the drivers at the top of each region are racing the drivers that you see on tracks and physically with them, right. but they're also shadow boxing the best drivers from other regions. Lage has done something incredible, two wins and a second place today. I mean, after a very strong result in the qualification rivals, that gives him so many points in the run towards Mexico. Right, let's go ahead and talk about the broadcast schedule. Of course, not only do we have a lot more racing coming up today, but also a lot more in series two. Wednesday's showdowns, you saw the first one on July 18th. Today is August 1st. We got two more coming up every two weeks, August 15th and August 29th for those Wednesday races. 
Gonna have a recap show on September 12th. We're gonna get ready for the playoffs on September 26th. And of course, we are headed to see that in Mexico on September 29th and 30th. That's really what everyone is playing for here in Series 2. Yeah, absolutely. It all it all ends in Mexico City and everybody's racing hard. Lej, he, he's not forgetting about Mexico City. He's not thinking about London. He's thinking about Series 2 playoffs. He is. He's going all the way there. Uh, we're seeing bots on social owning up to it a little bit there, mm -hmm. uh, saying it was my fault that crash didn't really uh, adjust my driving to how much the pack was slowing down. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of a... Well, a, a kind of an apology, but also a little bit of a blame <laughs> thrown there. But, but look at box two. I mean, just put it behind you, right? You, you've had a great series one result in, the, in week number one. Mm -hmm. He maybe it isn't where he wanted to finish today, but we've seen box be able to put bad results behind him before. It's what he needs to do right now. Yeah, that's exactly it. Of course, I think. As we said during this whole show, this has not been the end of the Lage box battle, right? I think that is all really just beginning. It is, and this is such a great story. They're so dynamic, the two of them on track. You know, we saw a move today, Lege on box at Homestead, especially that uh, that move, and then actually as well as that, back uh, at, at Bugatti Circuit mm -hmm. as well, right? So mm -hmm. Lege doing a good job to get around box here today, maybe throwing a little bit of a, a spanner in box's works there. <laughs> Right, so of course, but round two, of course, not over. We've got some Rivals events uh, coming up as well, as well as many events throughout the week. But here we go, August 2nd through 4th, the Rivals Booster Reward is going to be that Diablo SV. Yeah, classic Lamborghini. It's hard to believe a 1997 is considered a classic at this point. That's just because I'm old, but it's a great reward <laughs> and a great chance to get some extra points if you're looking for some points in the Forza RC leaderboard. Rivals Boosters, your last chance in round two. Absolutely, and that's not going to be it for today. Of course, we have North America races coming up tonight at 6 p.m., Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Make sure you tune into that. Lots of stories yet to unfold for North America. Absolutely. Yeah, lots to go. Lots yeah. to go. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. Guys, I want to thank both of you as well as Scott Cole, of course. Been a fantastic show and another great chapter in the EMEA history books as we go through the decades. North America is coming up in just a bit. Be sure to join us at 6 p.m. Pacific. And of course, also a big shout out to our sponsors here, Plantronics and Playseed, for making this all possible. We'll see you guys at 6 p.m. Don't miss it. Coming up tonight, the Wednesday showdown for North America.